TBL. <laughs> Sorry, uh, it's a bit random. Right. Okay, so um, I'm going to speak today about um, something quite different. I'm, a, I'm not a machine learning person. Um, I'm a theoretical neuroscientist. Uh, I'm interested in no coding and such, and not necessarily going to present you fancy uh, computations. Uh, but I think at the beginning of a theory for um, beginning of an approach that could allow us to understand um, the amazing uh, capabilities of the brain to learn and adapt to its environment. And also to do that with learning rules that appear to be li very limited in scope because contrary to uh, deep networks uh, in general, uh, the brain has only, uh, can only learn uh, based on pre and post synaptic messages. So things that happen very locally in the circuits. Um, but first, I want to share with you a few random images I downloaded on the internet last night. So here, the only point I wanted to make is that, well, the reason I went into um, neuroscience and not in math or physics is uh, because uh, biological systems are incredibly beautiful to my opinion, at least, and they are incredibly organized and they are incredibly complicated. But something that will, I will never be persuaded of is that there could be um, something in them that we will never understand or that is not there because it has to be there for evolutionary or behavioral purposes. Despite that, even simple organizing, uh, organi organ organisms, sorry, like the C. elegans, uh, that has just a few hundred cells, or we, we still don't understand exactly how this uh, nervous system uh, uh, works. Uh, and if we go to our brain, uh, it gets even complicated because we don't even know the behavior. We, don't, we can't even properly describe the behavior that the brain, behavioral problem that the brain is supposed to solve. Um, but something for sure is that it's not because our brain is bigger that is less organized or beautiful than the brain of C. elegans. And it's, in, it's incredibly packed in there. It's incredibly organized. Cell uh, the more we characterize uh, excitation, uh, the more we characterize the circuits, the more the less random it looks. Right. And on the other hand, we have to uh, live with data like this. It's absolutely scandalous, right? Anybody that records data in the brain knows how viable this response is. So here you have the response of a single cell uh, to a, a very simple stimulus, uh, a motion stimulus. And on a trial by trial basis, you find that the spikes counts, the spike times, everything varies to the extent that from a single cell, it's very hard to know when the stimulus started. And if you, if you give me thousands of spiking neurons recorded at the same time like what we have now, what the hell do I do with that, right? Because not only is each neuron very viable, but there's also a lot of correlations, uh, structure in that activity that I don't know how to characterize or relate to behavior, et cetera. And I don't think that because of this, uh, of this apparent, so this would, be, um, this would appear like a particularly inefficient way of computing or coding information, right? Because it looks so noisy, it would suggest that information is that each, ner each single neuron is extremely unreliable and that in order to understand uh, things, we should look at very large population of cells on average activity about large population of cells. And a very wide portion of computational neuroscience have dealt with this approach with, of population coding, etc. However, it seems to contrast with everything else we know about uh, neural circuits, at, at least in my opinion. So maybe we should uh, step back a little and try to understand its viability and uh, not as a hindrance on either how the brain computes or how we can build n networks that compute, but uh, has a, a true feature that is a signature of uh, the brain amazing uh, capabilities. <laughs> 
Um, so I spoke to you about local learning, and that's something I, I, I want to insist on here because um, it's, it's, you could see that as a hard constraint, as a hindrance, right? If you want to train networks in the brain, you need to train their synapses, and their synapses weight can only be changed roughly based on pre and post synaptic biophysical messages. So you don't have access to the global error made by the system. You don't have access to direct access to the reward, the input, the output. You're very, very far synaptically from uh, the, 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 the motor system or the sensory or the, uh, the retina. So based on these local messages, it would be very hard to learn any global function. So the way uh, artificial neural networks solve that is they use algorithms such as backpropagation, which are not local, but, but sort of backpropagate through the circuit uh, the error that are measured uh, uh, behaviorally. Uh, unfortunately, the brain cannot do that. Should we consider that as a hindrance? I'm not so sure. Right? I think if the brain needed backprop, it would have implemented backprop somehow. Right? But that's my opinion. I think that this locality has something I'll say in it. Uh, that uh, makes the representation in the brain more powerful or, or in, and more useful. But m my talk is not going to be enough to convince you of that, I think. All right. So uh, this is just, I mean, this audience doesn't need really a reminder, but this is just to explain why it's a problem to learn synapses based only on pre and post synaptic activity. The problem is if you try to map a particular input C to a particular um, output, um, to a particular out uh, output and you, you measure an error and you want to know how to change your magenta sy synapse here as a function of that error. Uh, the problem is that uh, if the error is positive, for example, could say, okay, maybe I should increase the weight of my synapse and increase the output. But in the middle, there is a, uh, before, the, before that information actually reached the output, there's many other synapses. And so in fact, you have no idea whether changing, increasing or decreasing that synaptic weight would increase or decrease your error. So you cannot base learning entirely on, um, on the uh, output error and the presynaptic activity. Um, so here, instead of, is this is? Yeah, sorry. So here, instead of, um, here we're going to backtrack a little bit. And what we're going to do is use a pure top-down approach. So we're going to consider a spiking network and we're going to ask the spiking network to learn a task. And spikes occur in time, so I'm going to think about how a, a spiking network could learn um, um, a dynamical system. So here we have a dynamical system, a, a variable here that could be behaviorally relevant, such as the position of the arm, for example, and obeys an unknown dynamics f of x, and there is eventually some input, sensory inputs, or there could be some motor commands sent to the arm, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So you have the, you, what you have is actually the input. You know the input, and you observe a trajectory from that dynamical system. For example, you observe your, your the sensory feedback from your arm moving in space. And from there, you need to infer uh, what this uh, dynamic is. Um, but let's say we, we don't only want to train that network to do this dynamic. We want that network to do it as efficiently as possible. Right? So, uh, the efficient, uh, so we, we sort of extend the notion of efficient coding to the notion to efficient computing. So we basically want to minimize an objective function L which would be a combination of an error, the error the network makes when producing a trajectory that is supposed to be uh, produced by this dynamic, f of x. So the estimation error made by the network, basically, plus a cost which corresponds to the total cost of neural activity. We don't want to spend too many spikes or too many neurons doing that task. Um, and the last, the last uh, assumption we need to make is how is this hidden variable, this state x, going to represent, be represented by the network? Okay. And here we assume the very simple decoder. The reason we did that is because we believe that's essentially what the synapse can do. Can a, synapse cannot do much more than that. So the, decode, the, the variable x hat is decoded by summing uh, the spike trains from that network. Okay. And because we want to compute uh, analog uh, variables, we, then we, we, we transfer, we transform the spike trains S into a continuous uh, um, response R simply by filtering the spike train through some time constant. Right. So if I, if I backtrack, we take our spike train, we filter them. We could, we could see that as a sort of 
synaptic integration, then we, we weight them, we, we sum them with some decoding weights D, and then we recover how state estimate X hat, right? So our, our network gets an input, it produces an output. That output is a sum of a spike, filtered spike train. And there is an underlying dynamical system that we do not know, but we're going to learn. And the idea is to ask the network to um, produce an output in blue that is as close as possible to the desired dynamics uh, given the input uh, it receives. That's the general objective. Right? So D represent the decoding weights that we assume the network has, and we're going to keep them fixed. Right? The F, we'll see how we can adjust the F. The Fs are the fit forward weights uh, that send the input uh, commands into, into the network. Is that clear? That's the problem we're trying to solve. All right. So let's start with the simplest possible dynamics that we could try to learn, which is a, a leaky integrator, right? So our dynamics is x dot equal minus x plus c, and I neglected the time constant here to, for clarification, okay? So we can, uh, we can play around with this equation and, and also write x dot plus x equals c, obviously, that's equivalent, right? So we put c into our network, and then we read out uh, uh, x hat from our network through this weight dr, now the rates are also the filter spike trains, right? So you can also write x hat dot plus x hat equal ds, which is equal equivalent to x hat equal dr. So here we, we thought we want to match essentially the spikes such that the left hand side and the right hand side uh, match as closely as possible. And a natural way to do that is to use a trick where we use the output of the network, ds, which is also uh, x hat dot plus x hat, and we directly subtract it from uh, the input c. So that the effective input to the network is not c, but c minus x hat dot plus x hat, which is essentially the estimate of c. Okay. So if we do that, then um, we can remove, essentially remove the connections between the neurons. We don't need connections anymore, right? The neurons just receive their own coding errors input, okay? And of course, the, we ask the network to keep that coding error as small as possible. So the question is, that, is that hard, right? It turns out that really it isn't, at least if we use a spiky network. So this is exactly the same network here. And I um, change a bit the aesthetic, sorry, but here we have this input, which is a, a C minus uh, the width sum of spikes, the decoded of the, basically the decoded output of the network. And we, are, we are want the network to minimize an error, which is X minus X hat. In other words, this input is E dot plus E. Okay. And now we, we these networks with these neurons are integrate and fire. So they are going to integrate E dot plus E, such that the membrane potential of one neuron will be the projection. So each, uh, here we, we place ourselves in into space, right? We are in a two-dimensional space, so it, which, which means that there is two inputs, C1 and C2, and the state variable x is two-dimensional. So here in input space, in x1, x2 space, the membrane potential of a neuron is the projection of, of its input current integrated, so E, on the on the decoding weights D, okay, right? So when, so as soon as, oh, more exactly the feed-forward weights, I'm sorry. So as soon as this membrane potential crosses the firing threshold, which is represented by this dashed line here, a spike will be fired, right? And if a spike is fired, it will go through the loop and immediately uh, suppress E. So what will actually happen is that, um, sorry, here, as soon as E is trying to cross the threshold, it's immediately brought back away from the threshold. So here I jumped ahead and decided that I would use the same fit forward and decoding connections, which turn out to be the um, optima if your network is large, okay? So the E is, is not able to cross that barrier formed by the neural threshold, whatever it tries. There will always be a spike, and it will be brought back towards uh, zero. And so if we have many neurons in our population, and they have different decoding weights, and these decoding weights cover the entire input space, 
then this air will never be able to get out of that bounded space. Right? So here we have just unconnected integrate and fire neuron, but thanks to their inhibitory feedback, they're actually able to keep their input, their effective input, that which is their coding error, in a very small portion of space that is delimited by the threshold, the firing threshold of all its, uh, its neurons. Is that clear? So um, how does this network represent uh, the variable x then? Well, it essentially provides a very tight, discrete approximation of this integrated input x. So this is a true x here, which is integra the leaky integration of the input signal c. Right? And essentially, if we start from 0, when this threshold is crossed, a spike is fired, which, is a which adds uh, the corresponding decoding weight to the estimate, right? And then a threshold, uh, then the error goes back to zero. A threshold is crossed again, and then a new spike is, and a new decoding weight is added, and so on and so forth, right? So the difference between the estimate x hat and the true variable x is bounded by this little, this little zone here, right? And as a result, x hat has to track x. It basically has no choice. Okay. So the question is, how small is this error? Right? I mean, we are used to see these random spike trains and there's random looking spike trains and assume that neurons are pretty unreliable. But in fact, here, the more neuron you have, let's say you have a, you, you're willing to fire n spikes in order to represent the variable, right? Then you can actually set up the threshold at one divided by n spikes, the total number of spikes that you're willing to fire, right? And the error will never cross that threshold, so it will never be larger than one divided by the number of spikes in your, in your network. So it's like the discretization limit. You cannot be more precise in representing uh, a, a, a continuous signal with discrete events like spikes. Right. If your neurons were really noisy, uh, then um, it would, at best, scale in one divided by the square root of the number of spikes, at best. Yes? The x and x hat, those are continuous estimates that you pull out of the spikes, right? The X spike. is, uh, yeah, X is extracted from the input C, so it's like the leaky integrated input C, which comes from outside. X hat is extracted from the spikes. So it's an average over time to compute a spike rate? Uh, well, it's an, it's a, what do you mean by averaging over time? It's, it's an estimate of the con the, this continuous value, the rate, which is estimated from the discrete spikes. Yes, so, so the, the time scale here, which is actually the moment potential time scale, is a, is a limit on the precision at which you can represent changes in your, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the temporal precision basically of your representation. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's a very stupid computation, it's just leaky integration, right? Uh, but already with a simple uh, architecture, so I forgot to say, uh, of course, we think of this uh, negative loop not necessarily as something that is implemented in the brain, right? but as something that is implemented in the neural population. Okay. No, short question. So right now there's no learning, right? You have just determined your D matrix and... No learning. The D, the D matrix is random, let's say, right? And if there's enough, it will always work. Threshold smaller and smaller, it would be more and more precise, but you have to pay with more and more spikes. That's right. Yeah. So the threshold is actually setting the cost. So when it's, um, so this network is essentially solving this this problem that I described before, right? And this cost term here determines how high you should set the threshold. So the the, so the price you're willing to pay to pay to get an accurate representation. So the last thing we do is that instead of putting an external loop here, we replace that by recurrent connections in the network. Right? Because if you put pass through D minus and then pass through F again externally, it's exactly the same thing from neuron to neuron than to do it dir with direct connections equal to minus FD. So this time, instead of having the network as a wall predicting its input out, we have a recurrent connection within the network trying to cancel the feedforward input received by each neuron. Okay. But it's a in syntax equivalent. But we need a specific structure in our system 
in general, f should be equal to d transpose, but if you have correlations in your input, it might not be the case, which is why I keep f as a notation for the feedforward weights. So uh, the question is how are you going to learn uh, these connections within the circuits? And uh, it turns out to be quite easy. So uh, we basically want to uh, start with an, uh, a recurrent network that has some random connections, recurrent connection matrix omega, let's say, right? And eventually converge to a network that has this perfect recurrent matrix minus FD, which would be the most, uh, the most efficient network in representing a leaky integration of its input. And uh, for this, we notice one thing, uh, that initially, before learning, the membrane potential of each neuron is a projection of X on its feedforward weights, minus the projection of the neural activity on its recurrent connections, obviously, by, by construction, right? But at the end of learning, if, if learning works, then the membrane potential becomes the projection of the error X minus X hat on the feedforward weights F. And that's the very goal of the system, to minimize x minus x hat. So in, ter in, so in fact, the problem of, of coding efficiency transforms into a problem of keeping the moment potential as small as possible. And they are actually two equivalent problems. If we train the connections here to keep the deviation in moment potential from zero as small as possible, we'll also train the network to represent its input as efficiently as possible. It's the same problem. And so any learning that would essentially be based on minimizing the deviation in memory and potential would do the job. Uh, so we proposed one, which is based on the grid minimization of, of uh, the variance of the voltage, right? And it's a very simple rule. So here we have uh, the memory potential of the postsynaptic neuron. Here we have time, right? And here we have the memory potential and suddenly we get, uh, so this is neuron I, let's say, and suddenly we get a spike from neuron K, okay? So this spike here, let's say this spike here is bringing us to the inhibitory connection and so it's bringing us here. That's not good, right? Because now, instead of, of bringing my moment potential back to zero, I brought it up be below zero, right? So in that case, I'm going to decrease my inhibition. In this case, on the other hand, this inhibition was not sufficient, so in that case, I want to increase my inhibition. And essentially, I want to stop learning when the moment potential is brought at zero. Okay, so this actually, we can never forget this. This is actually a learning rule that is minus SKV, VI. So it's based on the, on the, um, the correlation between the presynaptic input and the postsynaptic voltage with a minus sign. It's an anti habian rule. All right, so what? So this is just to give you more like, global picture was going on. Here, I, I, I mean, we, we made several, uh, since I'm interested in biological circuit, uh, we, of course, pushed it a little bit further in terms of biological realism. So here, here we built an EI network that has a learning rule that are equivalent to the uh, non dels no network I was presenting before. So it's basically a more realistic circuit, but otherwise uh, the same uh, principle. And so before learning, if we randomly connect this excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons, then they will fire all over the place, but it would be impossible to recover the input uh, from the spike trains because they are sort of diluted in complex firing patterns. At the end of learning, uh, the firing rate has gone low, low, much lower, right? So we actually decrease the number of spikes drastically, and yet we have improved drastically the capacity of a decoder to recover information from the input. Okay, so this representation has actually become much better than it was initially. So we have this paradox paradoxical effect that, that the error, the coding error of the network goes down to very small levels, despite the fact that the, uh, the statistics becomes more and more random. Okay, so if you look at single neurons, they look noisier and noisier. If you look at the population, it's more and more precise. So this is this conundrum that I think could explain this apparent difference between the observation of neural activity that is so noisy and the uh, observation of microcircuits that are so tightly organized and plastic. Yes. Um, just to get the big picture sort of right. Uh, so you assume, so X is a variable that somehow in the input 
um, now in this example by leaky integration, but could be more complicated. You want yes. to estimate that variable, right? Yes. So you want, and so in some sense, that's supervised learning, right? I mean, you this have is completely supervised. Okay. Yes. So and, and where the signal comes from is a different issue. So here, well, I mean, in this in this situation, we don't predict anything; we just reproduce. So this is a, this is unsupervised in the sense that it depends only on pre and post synaptic activity inside the network. But later, when I'm going to train it to a dynamical system, it will become supervised because, of course, I have to give it a training signal to tell the network do this, right? And it's unsupervised in this particular case because you just want to do leak integration. Yes, because it's restricted to one computation. Okay, exactly. Okay. The, it, it turns out this representation strategy will be used all the time, right? So that's why I've spent some time explaining it. But this, for the moment, is not very interesting. It's just <coughs> representation. Okay. Right. So since this is indeed not so interesting, I'm going to switch to more interesting stuff. So first of all, there's still something that is non-trivial that is done by this network. I'm sorry for this uh, here. Um, it turns out that initially we were, um, we were also using a learning rule that um, that uh, train the feedforward connections, right? So that the feedforward connection would pick up structure in the input. And they are important. They give you this nice um, representation that are uh, sort of adapted to the distribution of input and so forth. But it turns out that even without this learning rule, if you have enough neurons, the recurrent connections on their own will do this. That is, they will extract, not only represent their input, but extract uh, the structure of their input, do something like independent component analysis and reconstruct and allow you to reconstruct this input more accurately. So for example, here we train the network on some um, auditory signals, uh, so a spectrogram of an auditory of speech. And initially in a randomly connected network, you cannot recover the information, not, not with a network of that size, it's 16 neurons, right? And, but after learning, it becomes perfect at representing this auditory signal. And here it learned the very non-trivial test statistics of speech, right? Uh, if, for example, we were to test a system on a non-speech signal, it would be very bad. So it, it, it became specialized to speech. And paradoxically, the, the spike trains look now completely random. If you were to look at the receptive field, the spectral temporal receptive field of those neurons, they would look like a single bandpass filter, but not very interesting either. Uh, but in fact, there is a very elaborate computation occurring through the recurrent connections, which predict away, which predict away the input stimulus. And a signature of this efficiency is the almost perfect excitatory inhibitory balance that are now existing in each cell. Yes. And so this this uh, randomness of the spike trains. I mean, they get to see the same input each time. Uh, so the mm. randomness. What do you mean the same? Ah. Oh, uh, different. I mean, these are not. Sorry, different. these are different neurons. These are different neurons in the same trial. Okay, so but if you replay the whole thing, I mean, yeah, yeah. Initially, in the start, beginning of your talk, you were talking about the randomness of a single neuron across trials, right? Right. Okay, so that, uh, but you have not addressed this yet. No. Um, so in fact, uh, um, if these these networks can be completely deterministic, we can make them completely deterministic. Yeah, where the randomness comes from? Maybe That's correct. So this this network, for example, is tr we can show it's truly chaotic. That is. It has lots of inputs, and it has this high dimensional, in fact. And there's not a single neuron that looks like another neuron. And as a result, if we were to, on this trial, if you didn't put any noise, nothing, right, and repeat it, we would get the same spikes. But if we shifted one spike here, we would change the timing of all the, the, the later spikes. It's extremely sensitive to any, any small perturbations. Um, and to explain that, I have a figure here. So it's actually not a chaotic network, right? But it's a network that is composed of neurons that have all the same decoding weights. So in general, this representation is highly degenerate. You have uh, many neurons representing similar features in the stimulus. Right? And so that means that when they want to represent a signal X, the population can do the same exact thing with completely different ordering of the spikes. Okay. So it's, it is degenerate. So here I added a bit of noise to break the symmetry between neurons and get these uh, switches from patterns between different random, completely random ordering of spikes by the network. But you don't have to if you have the larger networks. Uh, I have some reason to, yeah, it's a bit more difficult to analyze that. 
So I, I don't know exactly why, but I think that's because there's no more neurons that have exactly the same weight. And, and so you get very complex trajectory uh, in, in these little balls, which end up being chaotic. Yeah. It's bounded and it's um, not periodic. All right. OK, so now we're switching to the more interesting problem, which is well, we're going to show that, I mean, this trick of, of, uh, of integrating viral networks, canceling their input, will turn out to be extremely useful when it comes to learning. Um, and here, we are focusing on learning dynamical systems. So we want this time to learn an unknown dynamics uh, F. So the output of the network is not the input anymore. What you're extracting from the network is a state, a state variable. And, and to have this state variable behave properly, of course, we'll need to have more recurrent connections in the network in order to predict uh, how the state moves over time. Right. So we start with this auto, this leak integrator, and then a uh, very, very simple uh, thing we could do is we could restrict ourselves to linear dynamical system. So if you have, a, if your dynamics is linear, so you have x dot equal ax plus c, which just covers a very wide range of dynamics that are important for us, like sensory motor dynamics, for example. Uh, then um, there, it's, it's quite easy to obtain these dynamics because what you can do is you can use the fact that x is represented in the, in the response of the neurons. Right? You can decode x from dr. Okay? So if you, get, if you decode x from dr, then you can apply directly if you were to if you knew the matrix A, all you would have to do is apply A <coughs> plus identity here, which compensates for Lilic. And then you put that back into the input. Okay. So here I, I completely unfolded the network, including the the inhibitory the fast inhibitory connections, so that you could see the two things working together. So if you do that, there are some terms simplify here. And the effective input to your network becomes C plus AX hat minus X hat dot, right? And since this is a virtually zero because of the inhibitory loop, you have X hat dot equal AX hat plus C, which is exactly the dynamics you wanted to implement. Okay, so here the network acts as a predictive autoencoder. It predicts its own, it predicts uh, the, the dynamics of its state and cancels that prediction to get the spectrums that would represent the dynamic of that state, which is a bit weird, but that works quite well. Okay, we achieve the same precision and the same uh, accuracy than and in the um, in integrator case. And finally, to generalize to general basis function, uh, to general uh, function, uh, we need nonlinearities in the network. So the idea is that you can approximate um, an arbitrary function, f of x, as a sum of basis functions. And what we're going to do is we're going to use nonlinear functions of the rates. And I'm not going to be too precise about what we do because it, it turns out it doesn't really matter. It could be nonlinear dendrites, nonlinear synapses, nonlinear spike generation. At the end, we just need this to be nonlinear. And you may, you may ask why. I mean, I mean, it seems like <laughs> so it should matter, right? But uh, what happened is that these networks are solving uh, are solving um, this problem, right? They find the rates that minimize the reconstruction error plus a cost. So in effect, the rates are solving, uh, f uh, the rates are functions of x because there's only one combination of rates which, which minimize that function. So even if very degenerate, the representation is very constrained. So if you look inside the network, you find that the rates live on these low dimensional manifolds that are parameterized by the state they represent. Right. So if you take any function of some combination of the rates, they will end up being a function of x plus some fluctuations that you can treat as noise. Okay. So that allows us to, to build inside the network a very rich set of basis function of x. The previous problem was insolvable. Right? You had lots of rates, you have lots of rates, you had lots of weights, right? And so you have as many, you had as many so equations to solve as variable, it was impossible. But now, thanks to this um, squeezing of the dimensionality by the efficiency principle of the network, you can solve that problem easily because you have lots and lots of basis function for a very low dimensional space. Is that clear? 
That reminds me of Wiscott's slow feature analysis. Do you think so? Or do you not? Know? Uh, actually, we are currently uh, uh, using that for unsupervised learning. So where basically the dynamics you will try to learn is the dynamics of your inputs. And it's, it, it becomes very, indeed, we discussed with Laurence uh, about that. It becomes similar in, in a philosophy. Yeah. All right, so, uh, so now we, are, we know where we can approximate our function. We know there exists a set of weights that can do it, the draw, but of course we need, we need to learn them. All right. So first of all, of course, we're still speaking in terms of a recurrent network. So this unfolded version is for clarity purposes. What we really have is a network with recurrent connections. Some of them are doing this predictive coding and learned by anti Fabian rule, right? And the other, these are doing this, sorry, this cancellation of the input. And the others, which turns out to be the important one here, are the one that learns the dynamics. And that the only difference between these two connections is that they live at a different time scale, okay? The, 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 the cancelling connection, the connection that console the inputs in blue, are super fast, right? Because it, they, they basically use spikes to reset the memory potential of the neurons. Whereas the predictive connections use the response, the filtered spike train. So they are filtered before they are put into the input. And that's the only difference that you need. In fact, you could generalize this to any network as long as you have two time scales available, one to do the cancellation and one to do the prediction. All right. Okay, so now how do we, are we going to learn these synapses? And I have no idea how much time I have. Three minutes? Yeah, all right. So here, for people interested, and I don't know why it's so slow. to go through my slide, but it's not moving. <coughs> All right, board. <laughs> okay, so what we are going to do is we're going to use um, adaptive control theory, because it turns out that this field, this is an engineer field, I've solved mo many of the issues that we have with uh, local learning and recurrent networks. All right. So um, the idea is the following. Ah, finally. No. Oh, no. Stop. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know why, why it's like that. Uh, like this could be better. So here the idea is uh, if you want to, if you have a, let's say you have a student network like we do, right? The student network has a set of basis functions and some weights. And you want to train the weights such that this student is going to behave like a teacher. This teacher is an unknown dynamical system that products, product, but produce an example trajectory X. Okay. So what adaptive control does is that it subtracts the output of the student from the, in, from the output of the teacher and then it feeds back this input inside the student. Right. So it appears like a very stupid strategy. You're enslaving the student. Yes, of course, it's going to do, to do what you want, right? But it turns out that then you can use a learning rule, which is W dot equal phi of x hat e transpose, e being the error. It's local because it's only depend on the correlation between the basis function and the error. And then you can show that there's a Lyapunov function, and it's not often that learning has a Lyapunov function, which is defined as the error plus the, the error of the tracking plus the error of the estimation of the dynamical system itself. And this is a Lyapunov function, its derivative is negative, blah, 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 and it's guaranteed to converge to the true parameter and to an error of zero. And believe me, there's not a lot of running rules in biology that do that. Okay, so that means it's going to converge quickly and accurately. And it can be directly translated into the network by filling it its own error. So basically, we assume that the is, these neurons here are receiving a feedback from the error that they've made. And this feedback is injected in each neuron, and the learning rule becomes then just a function of the presynaptic activity times the postsynaptic error feedback, which is local. It is not a Hebian. It is not presynaptic activity times postsynaptic activity. 
it's presynaptic activity times the postsynaptic feedback, times the postsynaptic feedback, for postsynaptic input received by the neurons. So it's something that should occur so in, for example, locally within a neuron, for example, in the dendrites. So what's going to happen is that in this microcircuit, when they turn into more biologically plausible circuits, you would have initially silent connections, right? And then the silent connections would discover that they are correlated with a feedback received from a higher level areas, which is a, a prediction error, for example. And if, this, if there's a correlation, this weight will increase. And it is not visible here because it's just local, but in fact, at the global level of the network, this will actually cancel the error. So this will stop when the error is canceled. And the network has become autonomous. Okay. And I believe this principle could actually be generalized to hierarchical network and many of other forms of learning in biology. The feedback is not only there to to, to be back propagated and to mediate learning. It's all there to push the circuit in the right direction. And the two together, and, and if you do that, you can actually make your system converge to the right solution. All right, so just a few examples. Uh, here we have, a, we, have a, we have learned a little guy that works. So basically we, we fed back the input, whereas this, uh, uh, where these dots on uh, on the guy, right? And and uh, we asked the network to reproduce that walking trajectory. And here to show how deeply the network has learned the trajectory, we inactivated 70% of the neurons. So you may think that if you inactivate 70% of the neurons, that the network will crash. But no, it keeps on walking. Right? It just has a slight slowing down. Right. That's because of the huge level of redundancy that this network has. Well, not exactly the redundancy. Degeneracy. It represents the trajectory in many, many different ways. And I think that's why it's actually able to generalize to all trajectories. Um, and then another example, this is, this is, this is only for the artificial needles of, uh, of a tractor networks in the rain. If it, uh, yeah. So here we train the network to, uh, to learn a, a ring attractor, so it's a two-dimensional input and it converges to a ring. Uh, and what happened then in neural space is that the network creates these bumps that looks a bit like the head direction cells in, in um, hippocampus. These bumps can point at any, can be in any position on, on the network. You can think of them as representing the orientation, the direction of the uh, input on the, on the circle. And they have this asynchronous irregular spike trains, even if this is a, a very uh, deterministic network. Um, and we can play the same game, and, and we can inactivate um, the, the bump. So it's, a line, it's an attractor network relying on self-excitation, right? So in theory, if you were to inactivate part of the cells, things would, should crash completely. It should start moving, or, but it doesn't. So what happened is, Ignore the green line, there's actually a bias, but what happens is that uh, when you inactivate part of the neurons, the other take over temporarily, and then you stop inactivating and the network comes back to its initial, the bump comes back to its initial position. Right. So we, we have made in, in a, si a system that not only has attractors, but becomes extremely robust to uh, mas massive uh, perturbation. That was explaining why it's robust, and I will go to the conclusion, I'm really sorry. All right. Uh, so, conclusions, I don't like conclusions. Uh, shortcomings, um, right, we need dance and the highly organized connections. So the question is how would this network scales uh, if we go from the meso microcircuit scales to the whole brain? And that's an open question. It's not as obvious that we, go, we would go less and less precise as we increase the scale. Uh, then uh, we need to do hierarchies and unobservables and hierarchical learning and so on and so forth. Um, it, I always have problems with people that don't like single spikes for some reason, but the brain computes with spikes, I insist. Um, and I would like to apply, uh, apply that to <laughs> shallow hierarchical networks like the brain is. So I think that actually this feedback, well, it's a completely crazy idea for the moment, but it's this strategy of, of, of using the feedback to control the network could allow us to I would solve the same problem than deep networks, but with far less layers. And uh, resources. Thank you.
your last slide. Um, computing with single spikes, right? Uh, it's clear that we have to be computing with uh, that a single spike rather than a specific multi-spike combination or some or spike combinations across multiple neurons is the is the sort of the primitive that we need to deal with, right? Um, so in this system, can do do subsequent spikes mean something different compared to us to take an individual? No, because uh, the, you might have phenomena like this occurring in the network, right? You may have phenomena like triplets or things like that occurring because of the dynamic in the network. But we have assumed that the decoder is not able to extract this information. The decoder is a postsynaptic integration of, of spike trains. Um, and that's true, it's a, it's a limit. So when I say the brain computes with spikes, maybe I should clarify it. In the brain complex, computes with membrane potentials, with its biophysics it's inside the cells. And the spikes are keeping this computation coordinated between neurons and bounded. Um, but it's still a very, um, a very sort of red-like view of spiking as being spike counts. Yeah. Maybe another question, if I, if I may. Is it the, when you talk about this uh, um, network to trying to reproduce X or compute X, uh, is it crucial to know all variables that go into X, or if my X is a dynamical system with 25 variables, but I but only one is imputed into the network, uh, would that approach be able to reconstruct all 25 eventually, or, or not? So are you saying what happens if you were trying to read out only one variable in these 25 variables from the network? Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what I'm asking, but, but, but uh, the idea is that if, if I'm trying to make a computation, but I have an input uh, only uh, a low dimensional subset of all of, ah. the, entire, of the entire uh, of the yeah. entire of the entire there has to be some kind of a tokens like structure that would allow me to still do the performance and I'm not quite sure I can I can see how that would work in this. So you're totally right. I think you nailed it. So here there is no hidden variable. We need to observe the full trajectories. Well we need to observe the state. Okay. Right. If we were to observe only uh, we add a projection of the state only, like a one dimensional projection of a twenty five dimensional state the brain, the network would not be able to learn. So w w you, w you might want to have uh, a bit like force learning or particle filters. You may have to want to have like underlying complex dynamics in the network, uh, right? And use them as a sort of um, bank uh, to uh, predict your input. I think probably a combination between the two. So just the point of how to scale this up. Um, have you thought of, so, I mean, this, this seems like it would work very well for these small scale local computations, but um, at the larger scale, there, there are like very clearly roles for neuronal communication through coherence and, and emergent oscillations. Have you thought about how you would build something like um, an oscillatory framework on top of this kind of model? We, we played around with it. I mean, you can be again, as many oscillators in other, these are dynamical systems. Now, um, we do have oscillation in the network as soon as there's delays. And we do have phase coherence and all things like that. But there are, there are phenomena. They are not coding. Um, they are not coding quantities. They are phenomena. Now, I'm not saying that's the only thing that there is, right? There's problems of interferences uh, between stimuli when you come to uh, choosing, making decisions or stuff like that. But uh, when it comes to the complexity of what the network can do, in fact, these networks are very, very high capacity, right? In f they, they can implement dynamical system of dimension n divided by two where, uh, where n is the number of neurons in the network. And in fact, if you train one dynamical system and train another, you won't erase the first one because the network has so many dimensions and this network neural activity live on this low dimension. You don't care about the other dynamics. Uh, they, they, they act like noise for you and you can learn a new one. So the capacity is still very high, but uh, it is not capturing anything useful about coherence and oscillations. Uh, so your model reminds me of some recent work by Gilman Gersner. You know, this, I think they call it following learning. Uh, do you know, like, a, what would be like a difference? Yes. So um, the follow network is. Um, network that is not, it's a, it's a, if you want it, it is using adaptive control, right. uh, but it is losing that in a rate model. 
and they implemented in a spike network by approximate integrate and fire neuron as a continuous uh, transfer function applied to uh, to the input. All right. So, in for, for, for when it comes to learning, it is a similar principle. For coding and on efficiency, it's, we are not speaking on the same scale. Their network has 30, there are 30,000 neurons firing at 30 hertz, and we can do the same thing with 30 neurons firing at 10 hertz. I'm so in love with the mathematical elegance of this, but there's one question remaining. You have the membrane voltage crossing at threshold, but I think that the first order Hodgkin-Huxley is more like the derivative crossing at threshold. Do you think that would work for your system too? Um, well, we are we are extending that framework. Uh, so for the moment, the inhibitory loop has only one time scale. So it's it's not able to capture dynamics in the input, for example. So now we are using multiple time scale, and the idea is that if you have multiple inhibitory time scales in your system and you train the network to console not only V but the derivative of V and the derivative of V, derivative of v et cetera, uh, then it will be able to be even more efficient in terms of spiking because it will approximate the dynamics of the system in its decoding. Now, um, it does not mean that the neurons would respond to derivative in moment potential. Or that's 